thank you for being with us. Uh, so François Xavier is a principal uh, at Erdik and, uh, and Strugel. Uh, is an executive search uh, consultant and member uh, of the uh, of the financial services practices uh, in France and in Belgium. Um, and I think on a personal note, uh, François Xavier, you're a fan of Stade Toulousain and uh, Bourgogne wines, so I, I'm pretty sure that you will find some people in the audience to discuss during the break. Uh, and Hervé started his career uh, as gold and emerald min miner in Asia, Africa and South America, but after a couple of years, uh, he decided to focus on talents instead of stones, uh, so he became a chair advisor in uh, many large organizations, such as uh, Vivendi, um, uh, LVMH, Airbus, and so on. And he has joined uh, uh, the exec search uh, seven years ago as a leader of the consulting practice. So he spent uh, most of his time uh, with, uh, with CEOs, uh, coaching them, and, and discussing leadership progress. Uh, and I think on a more personal uh, tone, uh, you also you do not uh, like only stones and people, but also flowers and nature. So you like gardening. Uh, near the Dordogne River, so maybe also some people in the audience uh, will be happy to discuss that during the break. Thank you very much, and I will let you the floor. Thank you, Noemi. And a special thank you to Claire Calmejan for inviting us. We are very honored to be with you uh, this morning. I, I will uh, stand up and walk. I'm, I'm more comfortable walking than uh, 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 sitting, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, so indeed, um, I have three passions in life, uh, rugby, Burgundy, and leadership, and especially leadership in financial services. Hervé and I have uh, spent quite some time together to work on the future of leadership in the financial industry, and this is what we want uh, to talk with you uh, about this morning. And uh, we will be uh, very interested to have your input and your reaction in the uh, Q&A. Hervé, over to you. Yeah, well, the idea is really to have a, a dialogue with you because I think it's always more interesting to uh, listen to you also and to share what you experience every day in terms of what is easy or what, not, what is not easy in terms of you as leaders. How do you bring your teams together and how do you prepare for tomorrow? which is, of course, what we all aspire to do. So basically, we will make some presentation of data. Uh, we we uh, assess, we recruit uh, thousands of leaders every year. So we have an amount of data, which is uh, enorm uh, enormous. For us, is how to create value and how to create trends out of this data, which is very important. And of course, is to uh, dialogue with you and to see whether you see that as well. And uh, how can you get better prepared to face that? So like you said, we, we recruit. And we assess people, so in our métier, it's our daily job to give feedback to individuals. And the purpose of this presentation is not to give uh, feedback to individuals in this room or feedback to Société Générale. No, the, the purpose of this presentation is to offer a collective mirror about leadership in the entire industry. Um, the second point in our introduction is that there are no conclusions in this presentation. These are more trends, and food for thought, food for debate. So let's start. Yeah. Understood. So what we've done, what we've done is look at more than 10,000 assessments at CEO and C-level. We've done this early last year, and we looked at the three previous years. We looked across all industries, segmented in five segments. And we looked at two natures of data. One is the self-assessment, so how the leader sees herself or himself. And we looked at the 360 feedback, so how the colleagues in the executive committee sees um, the leader. So in our findings, we will highlight where the two sources of data uh, confirmed the same idea, and at the end, we found uh, points of contradiction, so difference between how the leader sees herself or himself and how the colleagues see uh, the leader. So this is what FS leaders do well, and particularly well, 
compared with other industries. So the, the way to look at this for energizers, which are in blue in this document, the higher the score, the better. The left column in light blue is the financial services score. The column in the middle, which is dark blue, is the best in class industry. The right column is the worst performing uh, uh, industry. So if we start on the left, we see that FS leaders are particularly good at looking at underlying root cause. They are analytical. Moving forward, they have a good attention span, focus. They're good at identifying opportunities and threats facing the business, strategic skills. And they are good at balancing long-term and short-term priorities, planning skills. And you see that even in the, in the last dimension, FS is in the middle, so FS is best in class. Sorry for that. <laughs> we'll get there. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> I love this screen. Um, excellent. So then we talk about what FS leaders could do better. So there are four dimensions. The first one is about transforming. Um, so the way to look at derailers on the left side in orange is the other way around than the energizers. So the lower the score, the better it is. So if you look on the left, FS leaders, not all of them, 12% according to the study, and that, that figure is not the self-assessment. We have put only the numbers for the 360 as an average. So according to the 360, 12% of FS leaders have a tendency to become stuck in a mindset of this is how we have always done things. Seems familiar. <laughs> have a tendency to operate as though they have nothing more to learn. Invest little time in learning about the world around them struggle to fully understand the impact of new technologies, being disorganized, poor at project management. And you see that um, in the first, the third, and the fifth dimension, in the derailers, FS is on the right, worst performing. If we look at the energizers in blue, FS leaders create less possibilities from new thinking, invest less in new ideas compared with other industries' leaders. Uh, the next dimension is putting customer first. So that one speaks for itself. At least the definition, FS leaders have a tendency to neglect the customer. Great news, the worst performing is not FS, it's industry. Uh, on the right, energizers, FS leaders create or have a tendency to create less distinctive value for customers compared to other sectors. And you start to see that very often the industry in the middle, which is best in class, is life sciences. Could be one of the questions for the QA. Okay. Third dimension, it's about engaging. So FS leaders have a tendency to create relationships that are more transactional. So, 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 so it's, it's not relational, it's more transactional, task-driven. Let's do this. <laughs> have a tendency to make it difficult for others to provide feedback. So we need to be transparent and fair. This is applicable to all industries. So in all industries, you find this, this derailer as a pretty high score. And we, we, we found it struggling. Um, uh, uh, and it doesn't help. 
if you combine this with all the other derailers we're talking about, it doesn't help the case. The last dimension in the derailers is listening skills. But here, I, I like the granularity of how it is formulated. It's not only listening. It is listening to understand others. Much more powerful. If we go to the energizers, the first leaders have a tendency to less create meaning and purpose, have a tendency to less develop leaders, less collaborate across boundaries than leaders from other industries. Last dimension is about the self-awareness. So that's the dimension where we find a discrepancy between the self-assessment and the feedback from the peers in the executive committee. So I will read this slide from left to right in one sentence. You can sit, uh, attach your seat belt, be ready. So FS leaders think they're open-minded, creative, empathetic, self-aware, influential, but their peers in the executive committee think, well, <laughs> yeah, but not that much. So to be honest with you, and we need to be fair, all the scores across all industries drop. Uh, I don't have good eyes, but the empathetic in the middle for life sciences is 77% on the left, self-assessment. If you go on the right, empathetic, LS, 73%. So the score drops for all industries. But what is striking is that it's in FS that the scores drop to the lowest level, and you see they are worst performing in all categories. And consumer as well. Consumer as well for the last one. So, to, to, to conclude, I will come back on that one. We, we've been presenting this a couple of times. And typically, the first reaction is, but uh, where, where does it come from? Why, why are we like this? And our view is that the financial industry is uh, an industry of knowledge. It's an industry of expertise. Uh, you have a, a lot of focus and DNA around um, uh, actuary, underwriting, credit risk underwriting, liquidity ratios. And the way uh, people are promoted and selected from single contributor to team leader, manager, director, C-level, have a strong element a strong component in the profile around this expertise, this knowledge. And you see here, these leaders are analytical, focused, strategic, good planning skills. So you find here a very strong intellectual horsepower that influences the way they lead people. So where, where we go to with this style is no it all leaders. And if they are less engaging, uh, I'm all top down. Um, so what does it mean? It's a massive opportunity. We just arrived, Claire, when you were finishing your presentation and we were, you were referring to leadership, um, vision and execution, and culture shift, mindset shift, mindset shift. We're there. It's exactly that. Um, the massive opportunity is for you, for your institution, and for, for the whole industry. Because if you switch from know-it-all leaders who want to master everything, uh, we, we find CEOs who know the files on the table from finance, finance risk and writing, as well even better than people of, the, of their teams. I mean, it's crazy. It's very impressive. But we, with all the complexity of the world and the pace of change you were referring to, Noemi, um, you, you, you can't master it all anymore. You need to trust, empower, delegate, 
and that's that's a transition from uh, 20th century leadership style towards a human centered leadership that will be engaging that will create followership and the business case for you because i hear you are digital leaders and many of you lead transformation well um, if if you have um, a leadership style which is engaging, you will accelerate your transformation. If you ask your people to learn a new job, reskill, upskill, um, in Belgium, ING Belgium, when they did a reorganization, they asked the entire bank five, six years ago to reapply for a new job. The entire bank, when they moved it to Agile. Um, so it's a, it's a big ask that the financial industry is, is doing to the, to the workforce, right? But so, if, if you ask the workforce to change their job, to change the way they work, they, they work do, to self-disrupt themselves, um, um, breaking silos, working in partnership with uh, third parties, etc. whereas your leadership at the top continues with the old habits, the transformation will not happen, or would be very slow. So it's a huge opportunity for, for the financial industry. So how do you react to that? What, what were your surprise? Any surprise? I, I saw a lot of people uh, resonating to the data. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for, for you know for the presentation. One question is uh, is about um, uh, I would say the generation effect, multi generation effect. So is is it a correlation between the fact that on, on, on one side the financial services are uh, perhaps slower compared to the industry due to the fact that the generation as well is probably more on the boomer side in terms of leader compared to the new industry that can be more uh, Younger, for instance, and and uh, should we uh, think as well to uh, uh, you know having a more uh, diversity in in the way we want to manage those kind of uh, I mean the, those industries, or is it uh, all generation? Uh, no, I think it's all generation. Where, uh, so we we have uh, ways to look at the data from also an age perspective, and uh, when we slice into age generations, we don't see significant change in terms of data. So what we observe there will be true tomorrow as well until you decide to do something different in reality. Uh, the good news is that uh, the, 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 the organizations which have decided to change have succeeded to change this data. And the way they focus on what really matters, so we heard some words like uh, 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 agility, simplicity, this, this is easy to implement once it is a, there is a focus there in terms of leadership to get in that direction. Easy. At least you can deliberately decide to do things. <laughs> and it produces results. It's never, nothing is easy. Yeah, it's Horia. Uh, uh, I, I was wondering if it has something to do with the fact that we are really a very regulated industry uh, and uh, there is a low um, uh, appetite for uh, failure <laughs> and, you know, uh, try and, and risk. But uh, if I look at life sciences, uh, some of them are really <laughs> regulated too. You have the answer this to your question. This is my surprise, yeah, this is my surprise. <laughs> No, indeed, uh, and I, I will let you answer later, but uh, life science is a good example of a very highly regulated business, um, which has been uh, disrupted much faster than the uh, financial services. So the ones who are there are the ones who have survived, and it gives lessons in terms of uh, how to adapt to this new world, which is highly regulated and disturbed at the same time, disrupted at the same time. So life science is an example of what happens when, uh, let's say, uh, the, uh, the organizations have been able to adapt and to uh, cope with the changes. Exactly. It's a good question. Uh, a typical reaction we, we, we hear, so you're right. Um, regulations is not an excuse. And I can develop, but I, I think there were other questions. 
Yeah, um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding what you call financial services, as it covers a lot of different businesses, actually. And I was wondering if there was any specificity uh, of these results uh, towards the different businesses in financial industries. I mean, if you look at the uh, retail banking or uh, wealth management or market activities, I mean, are the results the same or um, anything different? No, thank you for the question. Gr great question. Uh, we didn't get into that granularity of data yet. Um, we want to use a an effect of, uh, of time to add more data, and we'll have more data, it becomes more relevant, and then we'll get into that granularity. Thank you. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that some uh, of our friends, competitors, uh, have uh, engaged into changing that. Um, how did they do that? Did they have to change? We've seen, you know, in some uh, COMEX or XCOs, uh, people coming in and changing 80% of the COMEX, uh, or did they really manage to keep some of the same people and, and change them? Yeah, there is always a dilemma between uh, changing the management or managing the change. <laughs> and probably you have to do both at the same time, but the, the solution is not to consider that the, uh, the grass is greener outside, in fact. So um, uh, the companies who have been able to deal with these topics have not decided to change all the management as if the management were the blocker, uh, but to educate the management and to share a joint journey to get in certain directions. And what we can observe, basically, so everything starts... And it's a bit frustrating to say it like that, but everything starts by the top. We are all the top of something anyway, so um, everything starts by the top by creating a shared vision. And that's always the case. So if you don't have a compelling project, um, a purpose, or a vision which will become the North Star of the team and beyond the team, the organization, it's very hard to go in a, a together in, a, in one spe specific direction. Uh, even more when everything else is blur, disrupted, uh, volatile, etc. So it starts by a vision. Uh, it starts also by a, a personal change. So um, moving from um, data-driven mindset to emotional-driven uh, people. So listening to emotions more than to reasoning. Thank you. <laughs> Again. <laughs> so um, letting emotions go and uh, becoming more authentic as leaders is also always what to observe. <clears throat> when we want to have a deep, sustainable change, it requires from the leaders to embrace the change themselves, to bring the right dynamic at the top team level, because uh, that's where you can create trust. And from there, you can cascade down, and you can then have your systems of deployment, be them uh, through champions, through uh, change agents, through whatever. Uh, but that's the, the start. Uh, I have one question. Like, if it comes from the top, it means that uh, it has to come. Uh, Pierre. So um, if it comes from the top, it has to come from the administrators in some way. And in like the current stages with dividends and all of that, it means that the mindset with the long term has to be more focused. Or we can initiate that part. No, the, you are right. Um, the board is ex extremely committed now. We see that uh, ESG has become very high in the agendas of the boards everywhere. And yes, of course, there are um, questions of uh, short term results. But also sustainability has become very high on the agenda of the board. So we see more and more board members who are asking questions regarding the values, regarding the mindset, regarding uh, um, how to shape a, a different culture. And that's part of the agendas of the board. So we do a lot of board assessment, and that's something we have observed for the last years. A shift, really, from, a, let's say, short-term return to short, of course, and long-term return. And the point is that it starts to be very effective when you stop um, choosing between short and long term. Because in reality, you have to do both at the same time. Uh, we, so each time you say either or, you lose, anyway. 
in this world, you have to do and and as much as you can. Uh, maybe to be complete. Uh at Société Générale, in case you don't know it, uh, but we have uh, three uh, people that are highly skilled at the board in digital and uh, IT. So we have Lubomira Rocher, uh, who used to be the CDO of L'Oréal for seven years. Uh, she brought, uh, uh, you know, the, she completely built uh, from scratch uh, the B2C distribution of L'Oréal. So when she took the job, there was absolutely no B2C distribution channel in L'Oréal. And she went up, you know, L'Oréal is a fantastic story with a sharp price of uh, two twenty two fifty. <laughs> I didn't look last time. But she came and she made the presentation on the importance of digital to actually raise the share price and to be part of this story. Um, I, I see Lubomira probably once a month, uh, you know, to make points on where we are. And she has also very specific question and she always challenge the board. Uh, we are welcoming a new board member, uh, Beatrice Cossa. Uh, that I saw actually yesterday morning uh, to facilitate our onboarding. So she used to work at BNP, but then she built a second career and she became CEO of Blablacar with a French company that organized car sharing. And now she's CEO of Belief, which I, you may know because we've, din, we've done the, the IPO of Believe, uh, you know, in France, uh, which is a, a music company. And she will bring a lot of strengths in terms of uh, Operating model, technology, strategy, how is it? Um, and we also have Nick, uh, Jérôme Contamine, who used to be the CFO at uh, Sanofi, who was in charge of the IT team and the transformation. So we have three references out of uh, 12, 11, 12 numbers, probably, with, uh, with Frederic. Uh, I mean, with Samuel tomorrow. Um, and I think, you know, over the first three years where I took the job, we went in average seven times uh, to the board between trainings and presenting strategies. And as you know, like, you know, we're growing and, you know, it's better understood also by our board what we are doing and what are the levers. Um, obviously, we, you know, but now our touch points are between probably three to four times a year, even if it's if, a bit higher. If I look at training, you know, we're still very present in terms of uh, uh, crypto, data and AI and everything. So it's just, sorry, I wanted to give you the data. It took a little bit of time, but, uh, you know, the board definitely is the one that, you know, pushed at the beginning for the creation of my job. And I've been very present at each step of the transformation and is very demanding uh, to the executive committee uh, in terms of what we need to deliver and how do we deliver it. And again, you know, in, in the, you know, Frederick was very pushy around the, 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 you know, the commitment of the CEOs on this area. Um, you know, we've built a strong, you know, uh, journey to date. Uh, and I think it will continue to, to, to go on very strongly under the leadership of uh, Slavomir. Maybe another question. Thank you very much, Arnaud. Um, you said regulation is not an excuse. You said mindset, change mindset is a major trigger. Um, have you identified maybe three main levers to accelerate transformation by the leaders? Can I walk? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, great question. So I've been wondering for the last few years how we could create the bank or the insurance company of the future, which would be innovative, uh, designing new customer journeys, and dare to try new things. Whereas at the same time, we are in a knowledge industry, and also we are in a regulated industry. Your question very regulated industry. Um, so it's not fine to make mistake in the financial industry. It's not part of the DNA. So uh, the, the, the idea we are developing at Hydric, we call this the freedom in a frame. So it starts with two pillars. You have in all financial institution, typically bank and insurance, you have um, Risk, finance, and they define the frame, which is in a frame where the PNL managers, the digital leaders, the CEO, um, 
can focus on clients and innovation um, and actually have fun, innovate, have freedom. And the mindset shift is about just considering that you have a frame, that this frame is a play field to have fun. So that, that's the mindset shift. The other consideration is that if you, if you push the, this concept uh, to, to implementation, you need to consider uh, it, it's up to the board. You need to consider that the, the, the profile of the CEO and the agenda of the PNL leader, it's, it's not anymore about technical re requirements and regulatory requirements. It's like you, you carve out this uh, from the CEO agenda and from the CEO profile so that you delegate this to the risk and control functions, so risk and finance. So it's about trust, empowerment, making sure the board appoints the right people, defines the right risk appetite, um, and then you can start to play. It means that within this play field, um, you can focus on clients, innovations, employees. Uh, I hear CEOs, again, they, they know so much about a technical topic. It's very impressive. But if, if, if you carve out this from the agenda, they really will start focus on, on clients and their employees. So it means that you can shift to a culture of uh, uh, know-it-all leadership who master all the details of all the files, technical files, to a culture of uh, engaging, creating followership, authenticity, uh, vulnerability. Vulner vulnerability means admitting mistakes. How often do you see a leader in financial services admitting mistakes? saying, hey, Pierre, uh, sorry for yesterday. Uh, I did something wrong. Right. Do you see that happening? What I hear is not much. But if you change that, you create proximity uh, with the people, and you release discretionary energy. Yeah, there are many data which uh, tells us that uh, the only and most important factor to create what you describe is what we call psychological safety. Uh, and the leaders who are able to create psychological safety within their teams are the ones who are really able to shape the agenda. So if, it's, it's not easy, but uh, that's something which can be done. So how can you create psychological safety in your teams by sharing uh, knowledge, by uh, being able to give feedback, instant feedback, positive and developmental feedback, uh, helping others to succeed. Uh, being more team-minded mind, to collab cross-collaborate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's really uh, the essence. I have a question, please, because when you were mentioning collective, I really believe that our managers, they believe that for collective action, we need to yes, be collective. But um, I don't think they believe in collective intelligence, because most of the time, our leaders are very intelligent, you, you are telling it, and I really believe they, they think they are more intelligent than the sum of all the intelligence around them. And don't you think, <laughs> don't you think we should choose a, a CEO that is a bit, maybe a bit less intelligent so that he will have to rely on the, the right persons and then he will have to rely on his intuition, uh, on his emotions to cope with these... Um, this thing that can be missing because over, all in all, um, I don't see the, the issue. It's always the same scheme, the same same things happening and we need something to change and I really believe we need the CEO to change first and I really like your, the word vulnerability. I think that's something that is missing. So if I rephrase what you say, it's better to select a CEO through their EQ, so emotional quotient of intelligence than the IQ which is uh, the classical uh, caution intellectual, as you say. And indeed, uh, what you describe is also intelligence, but it's collective intelligence. So instead of uh, having uh, people who are, it's not either or again, it's and and, you can be very uh, uh, IQ, I, IQ and IQ as well. So when we start with I, IQ, our job is to develop EQ with them, so to make them more emotional in order to grow this uh, muscle of uh, emotions. 
when we start with EQ great leaders, we also need to reinforce their IQ, so to create also data-driven leaders, because they need both. Again, it's not either or. You need to grow at the same time EQ and IQ. <clears throat> One dimension to keep in mind is that the, 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 the ECB will not accept that uh, we appoint for the CEO of a major bank or major insurance company someone who doesn't come from the industry. Um, so there's a dimension of knowledge. I know an exception. It's a fantastic exception of someone who came from payment, didn't come from insurance, and became CEO in insurance. And the regulator said, last time. <laughs> and he had to do nine months strategy in between, uh, uh, in a role below, to demonstrate he knew about uh, insurance and uh, kind of uh, interviewing, testing, etc. Uh, so, um, between having no experience and being a super expert, there's something in the middle. Uh, you, you can have experience in banking and insurance without being statisticians, mathematicians, actuary, or underwriters. There are a lot of other profiles with strong EQ, strong leadership skills, the ability to create purpose, vision, strategy, and, 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 and design a compelling strategy for all the workforce to follow. That's the future we're looking forward. There was a question. Yeah. Philip from Global Market. A uh, quick question. Just before we were talking about uh, failure, uh, before failing, we need to take the risk of failing or succeed. And after taking this risk, the question is the rewards. So what's your view on the level of rewards, especially in banking industry and, I would say, uh, standard banks? This not be our view, or, or my view, this should be the view of the board to define a risk appetite. Uh, I'm talking about the reward. You know you are taking a risk. If you lose, you fail. If you succeed, what you get. Exactly. So that's something we need to make it clear. Uh, to, from my experience, that's the role of the board to define a risk appetite. In front of the risk, there's a reward. That's the risk appetite. Uh, the risk appetite is applicable to uh, uh, credit risk, to markets, to data. There are some banks who don't want to play with data. Mm, I don't touch it. There are banks, they are playing with data, and they go 300 kilometers playing with data. So that's the role of the board. Um, sorry, I can't say more. Now, in terms of uh, mindset, um, the mindset of uh, becoming more agile implies to be able to test and learn permanently. And when you launch 50 projects, you can expect that 40 may fail and 10 may be successful, more or less. So failure is not uh, a mistake, it's a way of learning. And that's, of course, well, you know all the famous quotes on that. Uh, which means that it's not about black and white when it comes to reward. Failing fast can be rewarded. Sometimes uh, it's more important to fail fast and to learn from the failure than to have a quick, uh, small wins and uh, incremental uh, project or project which are on the, uh, at stake for many, many years and no one dares to decommission them. So it's, again, it's more a question of mindset and then you can define the border, the rules, etc. But the idea is really in these new ways of working, the more you fail fast, the better. And if you don't fail, it means that you have not tried enough because the world is full of opportunity. So if you just do what you know, you will, maybe you will win, but you will, mean, you, will mean you will win small. If you want to become the leader, you need to fail often, fast, and to get ready for that. So to think in terms of scenario, which is also a new shift in terms of mindset. So stopping uh, one scenario, which is the scenario, but having multiple scenarios and being ready to move fast on one scenario to the other, trying to anticipate and to go faster than the competition. Hi, um, I'm Claude from Global Markets. I have two questions, actually. One is um, regarding to your access to data. I mean, we're all struggling to have access to data. You're showing us 10,000 assessments. How did you get access to that? <laughs> Second point is that you show quite low level of performance, I mean, or results for financial industries. Is there any correlation with the performance of the financial service industry compared to industry, life services, consumer goods? 
I can start by, by the data. So just one figure. So in Paris, my team, which is a small team in Hydric, uh, we made 1,000 assessments in 2022. So, so we have many data. A lot of data uh, which come from uh, our own tools, like 360, like uh, other tools that we have designed, including AI-based assessment tools, by the way. And we have also other uh, data coming from other sources of data. So we have a lot of data. And uh, in fact, we could do much more in terms of studies because we could extract uh, function by function, country by country, basically, what are the key success factors to, uh, to be successful today and observe how it moves year after year, which is an outstanding observatory of uh, how to be successful leaders. Now, regarding the correlation between these data and the financial performance of the organizations. Can you ask the question again? I recall bad uh, scoring for financial services compared to other parts of the, 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 um, the survey. Now, is there any correlation in your mind with the performance of the sector. I mean, if we improve the scoring in your survey, will this, in your mind, improve the performance of the financial services sector? Yeah, so the, the model we use, like um, the different uh, drivers and, um, and derailers that are there, come from studies we have made precisely to identify what, uh, what are the key success factors of successful organizations. So there is a high correlation between how much you perform on this data re with regard with how do you perform as an organization. And, uh, and yes, we can say that the value creation of organizations is very correlated with the power of the leadership. We, we published a research last year which looked at um, the, the list of the most performing companies globally, financially, and we looked at their uh, corporate culture threats. Uh, what were the differentiator between these and the lower performing firms were a human-centered culture. You can find exceptions. I mean, I'm debating with people in the market with a, I mean, you, you, you have a, an institution which is super well performing, but look at the leadership. Yes, there are exceptions, but I, I think that on the long term, there's the risk uh, to lose good people at every level, from entry level, management to the top, because they, they don't feel aligned with their own purpose, the meaning, what is the meaning of what I'm doing, and they're gone. So we can replace them, but what, what new generation leaders, the new generation which is coming in the market is expecting today, uh, it's not this. So these institutions are taking a risk on the long term, and the other risk they're taking is that a one-man show um, with no trust in delegation, with lack of empowerment, the day that person is gone, what happens? Yeah, and maybe just to speak, when we look at performance, what do we look for? We look for long-term performance, so not only next year, but the next five years, basically. We look for organic growth more than uh, uh, acquiring organizations, and we look uh, with uh, not state-owned organizations, so which are financed by the private sector. And on these companies, there is a high correlation between these drivers and the performance. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to both of you. Very interesting session. Thank you very much. Thank you also to the audience because we wanted this session to be interactive. So I think it's a, it's a success also from this point of view.